Welcome back to Mid-America Reformed Seminary's Roundtable Podcast. This is episode 144. Thank you for tuning in. I'm Jared Luchbord, Director of Marketing, and I am here still with Reverend Andrew Compton, who's been uh, enlightening us on his dissertation, which is on the book of Ezekiel, specifically how uh, the book reflects uh, Ezekiel's vocational identity as a priest prophet. And uh, Reverend Compton has given us some insight into uh, vocational psychology and the various uh, sign acts that uh, Ezekiel performed, which uh, manifests this vocation that he does have uh, as a priest prophet. Uh, But now Reverend Compton is going to engage a little bit more uh, on Ezekiel's concerns with uh, purity issues and his vision of the glory uh, of the Lord, and then also of uh, the end times temple that we read of in the latter portion of the book. So, Reverend Compton, thank you very much for being here one final time. Looking forward to uh, seeing what you have in store for us. Yeah, thanks, Jared. Well, it's been it's been good, and if I applauded you for coming back for part two, I applaud you even more for coming back for part three. Yeah. <sighs> Is this supposed to be a crowd? Yeah. Okay, I'm just... Just confirming that. You're so amazing. <laughs> we have fun around the table, my friends. No, we looked at, uh, again, the, the way in which a vocational psychological reading of things like ritual and job crafting and all that could help us uh, illuminate Ezekiel's ongoing priestly identity. Well, that's not the only chapter in the dissertation. I, uh, I picked three other things to explore, and we'll just I'll just survey them in, in kind. And again, this is not going to, this is not going to exhaust your knowledge of the book, or even your knowledge of the subject, or even give you a, a real in-depth understanding of how I arrived at these things. But it's simply illustrating the kinds of work I was doing in this dissertation as part of exercising. Uh, this particular set of interpretive skills um, in in pursuit of this terminal degree. Well, the next thing I looked at was this question of purity and impurity in Ezekiel. You can do an interesting analysis. I mean, now that we have computer concordances, um, you can you can do some pretty high end searches using Bible software in the original languages. So in this case, in Hebrew that will generate statistics lists. There's been some interesting work over the last couple decades on statistics and biblical interpretation. For example, one one set of scholars looked at a number of grammatical features of the Hebrew language that would indicate whether something was prose or, or, or narrative or whether that was poetry. Because more often than not, those particular features... Uh, did not occur in poetry. And so they isolated those features and generated a giant spreadsheet of every chapter, as, as made in English Bible chapters, which don't always line up, but just for the sake of analysis, they, they created these statistics. And lo and behold, it showed us which passages of, of the Old Testament were more densely packed with poetic features and which which were more densely packed with prose features. As you can imagine, books like Psalms and Proverbs were packed with poetry features. But then you would also find little places of poetry popping up in other other sections, or you'd find prose popping up in other sections. So it was a very interesting statistical analysis, and that that can be pretty helpful. All of a sudden, you, you um, you can sort of isolate poems elsewhere in the scriptures that you might not have uh, thought to look for. Of course, um, Exodus 15 is a poem that's in the midst of a whole lot of prose. But anyway, statistics. And I bring this up because what I was able to do is generate a list of terms for purity and impurity and wash that through this program and found that while, of course, um, Leviticus is very high up on the ladder about what is uh, what is considered or what has concerns for purity, Ezekiel was right up there too, along with numbers. I went further and was able to isolate passages in Ezekiel that had a high number of purity concerns uh, based on total number of words in the the passage. 
and then how many purity terms came up. And I, I really zeroed in on Ezekiel 22, verses 1 to 31, and Ezekiel 20, verses 1 to 44, as two chapters with very high densities of purity and impurity terms, which then allowed me to kind of test this idea of what is Ezekiel maybe doing that might showcase a priestly interest in purity or a priestly focus upon purity and impurity. Now, that's valuable because, of course, Leviticus is very concerned with purity and spells out how priests are very involved in purity. But it's also interesting that modern researchers looking again at exiled groups have found that purity is a concern quite often for those groups as well. Again, I'm not trying to say that proves biblical things. We don't need things outside of Scripture to prove Scripture. Scripture is uh, autopistos. It's, it's self-authenticating. Okay, But it can be very illustrative to see something that we have a theory about in Scripture also illustrated by other people. It at least gives us something to, uh, to read it against and illustrate with. Well, two examples that I was looking at. One uh, was, the, uh, was the Mandean religion. Mandeanism is a, a kind of strange Gnostic uh, religion indebted to John the Baptist purportedly, uh, but, but very shot through with, with purity concerns and water rituals. But the problem is that Mandeism, which generally was from the Middle East with a, more, with a warmer climate, due to diaspora, um, found itself in places, yes, like North America, but also places like you know, Norway, you know, or you'd find you'd find Mandeans in places with very cold climates. The problem is that Mandean purity rituals, as as the core of their religion, requires uh, fresh flowing bodies of water, not stagnant water, not pools that are indoors and heaters, but rivers. Okay, how then do you go about your needed rituals in a place where it's like negative thirty out, and the flowing rivers aren't really flowing right now? Now, I mean, I just use this as an illustration of this This shows uh, a migrant group trying to cope with things that were, were keeping them from engaging in their typical practices because of their new location. Interesting, in a, in a slightly different note, a uh, number of sociologists studied, they studied uh, people in Tanzania. They studied the Hutu refugees in Tanzania. Who, um, who had to escape uh, genocide, some from Rwanda, some from Burundi, and were noting uh, how these, um, these Hutu were taking what ordinarily would not have been conceived of as, as issues about purity, but treating them that way. And so they started saying uh, there, there was sort of infighting between the Hutu um, refugees who lived in the refugee camp and the Hutu refugees who went ahead and settled in the city. And those in the refugee camp started using language of impurity to describe the work, the people, the Hutus themselves who had settled in the in the city. And it's just interesting then to see a, a group, again, not a Christian group that we're, we're conceiving of here, although many of them may have been Christians. That's just not what these scholars were looking for. But it at least illustrated how purity is something that refugee groups can latch onto. And that would at least make us say how much more for a priest in exile for whom purity is already an important thing, for whom biblical revelation says purity is important. How much more would we expect them to try to preserve purity in exile and yet deal with some of the things you can't you can't deal with. And so that was something I ended up doing with this this passage. What I especially found fascinating was how Ezekiel, as a good exegete, as a good interpreter, as a good prophet of earlier scripture, was frequently in these two chapters, 20, 20 and 22, would take things that in Deuteronomy, sins that had not been associated with impurity, but now Ezekiel is uh, is applying them to purity concerns as well. So again, I thought that was that was a perhaps another good is, illustration of a cognitive crafting, of conceiving of traditional categories and showing now a priestly purity import as well. 
and maybe even a task crafting or job crafting kind of strategy of employing these other kinds of purity concerns as part of the the other kinds of judicial concerns he would be engaged in as a priest. That's what I looked at with the purity chapter and tried to explore um, how we might think of that. I went, um, next next chapter I dealt with, looked at this, uh, the, the glory of the Lord that shows up in Ezekiel 1, uh, later in Ezekiel chapter 8 to 11, and then uh, again in a, at the end of the book in Isaiah 40, or Ezekiel 43, and tried to ask how Ezekiel's uh, preaching about his encounter with the glory of the Lord, the kavod of, of the Lord, the heavy thing is what literally refers to. Uh, and I actually, it's making me think a lot that we want to be mindful of the what the kavod is distinct from God's glory, generally speaking, but the kavod as a localized manifestation of God, interestingly, in, in bodily form, both in Ezekiel and in Exodus, um, which I think is not incorrectly attached to uh, Christophany, but that's taking us a little far afield, but for those listeners who, who are tracking with Christophany and Theophany kinds of concerns, um, also who, who might be interested in Meredith Klein's suggestion that the, um, that the, the pillar of fire and cloud may be more of, uh, of a, a manifestation chiefly of the Holy Spirit. Um, I, I think this does make us think about the difference between the kavod and the cloud and the fire. Uh, and and if there's an interaction between the two, that's fine. But this does seem to indicate the kavod more in the, the categories of Christophany um, than anything else. But that's a side note. Um, but I did look at this vision of the kavod, and I, I noted how Ezekiel draws on a number of Old Testament passages, uh, especially in the wilderness narratives in the accounts of Israel wandering from Egypt to the Promised Land, and he taps into descriptions of the kavod there, but then also pulls them uh, into other concerns and and does unique things with them. And so, for example, there's times um, when uh, the kavod is is depicted not with bodily features, non-anthropomorphically, and then there's there's the one place with Moses in, in Exodus 33 where the kavod does come and has a hand and has a face that it won't let Moses, that he, and the kavod is a he, you know, that he won't let Moses see and instead lifts his hand off of Moses after he has passed and allows Moses to see his back. So the kavod has these, these anthropomorphic parts, body parts. Same thing in Ezekiel 1 where when he looks up, he sees the kavod seated, bodily posture of seated on a throne, uh, with, uh, with midsection like a torso, and and he sees the kavod in bodily form. Later, the kavod has a hand that that picks him up, and or like an angel picks him up. I mean, but but the hand there's 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 these kinds of bodily things that he's noticing, showing Ezekiel really latching on to that description of the kavod in Exodus thirty three, while also pulling in the the wider range of kavod passages. And here too, it was interesting to think about ways in which Ezekiel's encounter with the kavod was unique to Ezekiel, but also how that is also evident among other migrant groups who want to retain an orthodox, uh, faithful understanding of the scriptures, and yet need to highlight other elements of, of God's character that help them cope, right? I mean, you, you think of, of, um, of even somebody suffering from a, a type of, of long-term disease, let's say, and they, they're being tempted by people who are saying, you know what, you should go into open theism because you should go into the idea that God wishes he could help you, but he just can't. And he's as, he's as upset about your, your disease as you are. Well, is that orthodox? I mean, not really. <laughs> and, and a lot of people suffering from disease don't want to be heterodox. They're going, no, that's not going to help me. A God who's so inept, he, he can't do anything about this. But they are really comforted by emphasizing passages where God is showing compassion for the weak. He is showing compassion 
uh, for the helpless. You find a lot of you find a lot of very strange uh, Latin American theological reflection, but you also find some Latin American, meaning immigrant from from Latin, you know, Central South American countries, that are trying to remain very scriptural, but are helping, uh, or I should say, are emphasizing elements of God that are very comforting to them through the uncertainties of migration from their home countries, often to North America where they have language barriers, where they have stigma about being um, being Spanish-speaking immigrants, right? This is It was just an interesting thing to make a comparison with. And look how Ezekiel, much more so than even Isaiah with his vision of God's holiness in chapter 6, much more consistent than, than other prophets, identifies, and, and or maybe, I, maybe the best thing is to say he highlights the Old Testament portrait of God that shows him to be mobile, moving with his people through a wilderness. And I think that's very fascinating, and that's exactly what you would expect of a, uh, of, of a migrant uh, and of an exile like Ezekiel was, based on other kinds of exile studies. And it also then helps to think, even in terms of, might this be a sort of job-crafting idea of helping to illustrate, you know, that that relationship crafting, if you will, showing to the people that he's ministering to as a priest that the God that they worship is a God who historically has moved with his people, who's not been distant from them, even though he's they are distant from the seat of his his reign, the temple. And so by focusing on the Kavod, it allowed me to kind of um, explore that kind of concept. And then finally, uh, I spent some time looking at the the, t- the temple at the end of Ezekiel. Now you mentioned the eschatolog or the uh, the end times temple. Um, there's certainly end times kinds of features, although our dispensational uh, brothers and sisters will often uh, try to refract that end times nature through uh, through the Left Behind novels and, <laughs> and all that. Yes, but um, but at the same time, there is very much an end times component because there's a heavenly component mm-hmm. to this temple. Uh, uh, G.K. Beale has very ably illustrated through his own exegesis, but also summed up much material that shows Ezekiel's temple as as a description of that heavenly temple presence of God being brought into um, coming down to earth in the fullness of time, which, of course, the temple of God did just that in the incarnation of, of the Son when he, was, when he tabernacled among his people, as John 1 tells us. But here's something that is often, I think, underappreciated. We can sometimes, because we rightly are wary of empty ritual and of, 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 and of superstition, we see people who, have, who treat uh, holy relics in very superstitious ways, and we even see tr- people who treat the, the book of Scripture itself in a superstitious way. They, you know... Um, some people will, will try to carry a Bible with them because they think it's going to keep them from getting in car accidents or something. Never mind the fact they've never opened the thing, right? At the same time, we, we have gotten so used to texts, textualized things, paper with writing written on it, or media that has been engraved with writing, that we don't often realize just how powerful is the textualization of something. The fact that we have God's Word not only in our hearts as we memorize it and in our ears as we read it and speak it to each other, but preserved in textual form that can be handled with our fingers, that can be looked upon with our eyes, that can, you know, again, we're, we're sitting here and I can, I can hear my pages flip. Um, that's no small thing. And we have often minimized the the significance of text, especially in the digital age. I'm very, I try to discourage people from doing all their Bible reading on Kindles or e-readers. Mortimer Adler once wrote the book, How to Read a Book, and, and he would highlight how when we read a print book, your eyes remember where things are. And I think some of our listeners will appreciate this. Can, can you think of a passage that's very meaningful to you? You don't exactly remember where it was at in the book of you know, Matthew, but you remember it's on the right page and it's toward the bottom on the the far right column. Visually, because of a visual text, 
you are more cued into the content of God's Word. Now, I will fully grant that some people may be able to do that uh, with digital tools. They may have a better brain than I have. Uh, that's that's fine. I'm not trying to be false hum, humble there, right? Some people are able to do that, but not. But I don't think most of us are. And I think that's why the Codex, why the book is such a remarkable invention that God and His providence enabled us to receive His Word in. Well, it's significant then that the final chapters describe a temple, yes, a heavenly description of it, but it's a textualized blueprint almost. It doesn't have all the elements of a blueprint, so it's clearly not a blueprint to to rebuild. We don't have height indicated except in, I think, one place. But we have a text. And what's fascinating is how elsewhere in the Holy Land we find texts of important things. For example, the priestly blessing of Numbers chapter 6 has been found on little tiny silver amulet scrolls that people would inscribe and then bury with their loved ones. Now, at its worst, it's superstition. But at its best, one could say, look how these people believe that Scripture is indeed, the blessing of God as presented through Aaron is indeed relevant to his people, even those who die in in faith. Um, There's times in other, uh, other kinds of temples, there's like, um, this is a Philistine temple, where there were Philistine god blessings inscribed into the walls. And it's interesting then how media is used to help highlight the presence of the god who speaks these words. Now, I bring this up because of this this analysis I did with with regard chiefly to, to Ezekiel 40 to 43, I focused on those chapters, which some people think are some of the dullest in the Old Testament because it's just measuring walls and measuring spaces between walls and all that. But not only does that show a concern for precision, something that has been has been evidenced among other refugees who are trying to, uh, in, a, in a world full of lack of control, will often try to organize and categorize things in much more tangible ways. Um, that's a very fascinating possibility. But also, many people, many of these flurry scholars I've talked about who have written about Ezekiel's priestly identity have said, aha, Ezekiel has no temple. That's why he can't be a priest. But he does have a temple. It's a textual temple. It's a media temple. Now, our modern minds think, well, media, that's bad because it has all kinds of you know nasty shows and stuff. Well, wait a minute. Media, though, just simply refers to the, the medium by which a message is communicated. He has a temple in media form, is there a possibility that that is sufficient for a priest in exile? I would think it is. Now, if um, of course, the existence of the heavenly temple is itself sufficient, but the very textualization of the temple, the writing down of the blueprint, um, functions in a lot of the same ways that the writing down of the blueprint of the tabernacle did. Those who read the blueprint of the tabernacle are led through the theology of the tabernacle when you, when you go through those passages uh, in Exodus. And some have even suggested that the whole book of Leviticus is organized based on the principle of the tabernacle blueprint, that as you read Leviticus, you are being brought on a tour of the tabernacle. Look how those who lived many years later, those who lived even in exile, those who lived after the exile, the time of of you know, uh, Malachi and Haggai, right? Look at how they could, without seeing the tabernacle, some of them, you know, just with a very sad model of the, of the new temple, yet could participate. As they read the book of Leviticus, they too could be brought through the theology of the tabernacle in a very vivid, <laughs> tangible, um, textual way. Anyway, well, this is... Uh, Frankly, I know this is gonna. This just sounds kind of weird. <laughs> some of these things, and that's what makes a, a dissertation tricky: is that you're trying to explore possibilities you may not have thought of, but at the same time, you're trying not to fall into what Calvin warned about undue speculation. Um, admittedly, some of these things really push up against the limits of what we can really know for certain. But in the context of a PhD dissertation where part of it is framing the questions and knowing how to test the questions, this turned into a really good set of exercises 
of applying uh, a, a, a concern for vocational identity to uh, questions about Ezekiel's priestly identity. And in the end, I think this has really made me think a lot more about how we in the church need to make sure we're, we're constantly thinking through Christian vocation, thinking through our callings. There's been a lot of good books that have been written. I've got one in front of me by James Hamilton called Work and Our Labor in the Lord. Uh, Tim Keller has a book called Every Good Endeavor. Uh, Daniel Doriani has a book on work he published just in the last couple of years. There's books, uh, several of Kuiper's writings, his lectures in Calvinism, for example, really explore work and thinking through work and worldview. So important that we think about our calling to bring glory to God in our work. And as we think about those times in which our callings may feel like they're being thwarted, either because of loss of job or because of bad coworkers or a bad boss that are preventing us from doing the things we really feel passionate about, and yet how vocational psychology, okay, can pragmatically give us some coping mechanisms, but also showing us that there's something that is very much to be expected that we would have particular vocational passions because of us being created in the image of a God who works himself in creation and in preservation, but also a God who creates us to fill the earth and to subdue it, to engage in work unto his glory as we await his consummation and renewal and glorification of all things. And that does it for our sneak peek into the dissertation work of Reverend Andrew Compton on the prophet Ezekiel and his vocational identity as prophet and priest. If you hear anyone wondering aloud what Reverend Compton does outside of teaching and preaching, well, you know where to send them. For more podcast episodes, you can find us on our website at midamerica.edu slash podcast and wherever you listen to your favorite shows, be sure to search for and subscribe to Mid-America Reformed Seminaries Roundtable. I'm Jared Luchibor. Till next time.